yeah i would actually recommend you something if you ever start a consulting business and this is coming from real life experience mm-hmm. if you are selling to indians indians love getting deals they love getting a negotiated price right so if you want to sell your time for say a hundred dollars an hour you'd be stupid if you quoted a hundred dollars an hour because the guy is going to try to negotiate you down a bit and if you don't negotiate he's going to be very unhappy and probably not sign up on the other hand if you see like if you charge 150 and then you negotiate down to 100 <laughs> the guy is going to be really happy hey wow i negotiated I can't down. It. right i'm getting this great deal yeah he's going to be really <laughs> happy and you're going to get what you want so sometimes the so guy think, can afford it and they'll say can you charge 200 and if you quickly say yep let's do it they'll think oh man i should have went for 150 i should have went 150 <laughs> yes exactly so if you get offered a price try to charge like slightly more just so that he's happy he doesn't feel like oh, wait i think i'm overpaying now right did you ever have that period where you worked with people that were broke like college students uh, people that are failing entrepreneurs and stuff what do you mean by worked with uh, consulting uh, did you ever consult them for any service no you well, good i think some of them were not very rich but no one was flat out broke see if you're broke you don't have to pay taxes and you don't have legal issues so why would you uh, come to me not not broke but not not doing well for themselves enough to complain about what you're charging them so my policy has always been that if you can't afford it find someone else good i, I like that because there was a certain period I was working with, I was trying to get a feel for what pain points are in communication. And I was working with, I want to say college kids, but um, master students and such. And they don't have money like that. Uh, entrepreneurs that are one to two years in, they don't have money like that. And the whole point in trying to sell them is such a hassle where you actually have to try to sell them. But when I switched to, let's say, CEOs or manager, managerial directors and stuff, they're so eager to pay. They're like, well, well, how, how do I send the money over to you? And it's just night and day difference. I'm thinking, why would I ever work with these broke guys again? Let me just work with the people that want to pay and they're more willing to learn too. Not only are they willing to pay, but they actually apply the information. See, I'm going to give you some real life advice, Arman. Mm-hmm. Never work with people who don't have money because they act like, the money they're paying you is the last money they ever have. And you're supposed to save them, their entire family, and make sure they never have any trouble because they paid you that money. Right. That's what they actually act like. And they don't understand the concept of value. So if they pay something like 20 bucks and you give them like 50 bucks in value, they're going to be like, I got scammed. I should have gotten like $300 in value. I want more. I want more. They're never happy. Mm-hmm. And they don't understand the value of things. In the sense that, let's say that you teach them something like, let's say that they pay to improve the social skills. And then you tell them the basic advice that they need. Like you need to talk less, you need to listen more, things like that. The simple things to improve your social skills. Right. They're going to say, I could have read that on the internet. Why am I paying you? Like, Dude, I gave you the thing you needed. And this is what you need to do. If you could read, have read that on the net, you should have done it. Why did you come to me? So they don't understand the concept of, you know, you will get what you need not some kind of random ass secret technique or something. Right, right. You nailed it, man. Where broke folks, they want length. They want a lot of big stuff, big talks, big books, big consulting sessions. Where rich folks, they just want the message. If it could be done in five minutes, five minutes will do. Why are we going to waste our time and such? And they are going to leave satisfied or if you give five minutes to a broke dude, they're going to be like, oh, man, this guy definitely scammed me. I'm like, bro, how many different ways am I going to tell you to improve your social skills? Dude, you will find this in the ebook market where if you're selling to broke people, right, they care mm-hmm. about the number of pages of the ebook. So I've like, seen if you take the 90 day self-improvement program, I sell live intentionally. Mm-hmm. It's like 55, 60 pages. And. I could make it bigger, you know, as a writer, for me, it's extremely easy to write a 300 page book. I can do that in a week, but why would I waste your time? The entire point of the program is to give you discipline and to give you better habits and to tell you how to do that. It's a step-by-step process that actually works. Mm -hmm. Now, every once in a while, this happens like once a month, 
someone's going to reach out to me and say like i paid 20 dollars for this program that means you charge me about 50 cents a page and that's not enough i want more pages like you should make it longer losers mindset what can i tell you dude this is going to solve the problem that you have it's going to make you more disciplined you're going to start waking up earlier you're going to be fitter you're going to lose fat and your habits will be better the book is going to deliver to you what you have from what has been promised to you and here you are complaining that the book is not long how will that make it better <laughs> Did you ever ever have that moment when someone DM'd you and said, convince me why I should buy the book? Oh, yeah. They get blocked. Do they? Okay. Because I know some people that actually waste their time trying to convince them. I never convince them, man. I'm like, bro, if you need it, buy it. If you don't, don't. Simple. Have you ever told someone to not buy a book? Because I've done that a lot of times. I have. Yep. What made you do it? They, they just so didn't they the book. Typically ask questions like, that's on the sales page. They will ask questions that have been addressed on the sales page in clear, bold format. So is this a PDF or uh, in a physical book? Mm -hmm. Do the sales page says PDF literally in bold characters three times. You haven't read, you haven't done the work. You haven't even read the page and you're asking questions which have been addressed. It's, it's a simple thing to do, right? You can just control F PDF and find it. Sometimes they'll ask questions like, you know, am I guaranteed to make a hundred dollars a month with this guy? There are no guarantees in life. You could make 110, you could make 90, you could make like a thousand bucks a day. I mean, there are no guarantees. Like, can you guarantee me this? Like, do, do not buy the guy. You, <laughs> you sound like the customer I really want to avoid. Right. Who, who isn't going to put in the work and is going to be like the guarantee didn't work. And then they're going to bad mouth you and, it, they're just a hassle. It's actually better not to work with them. I call that blood bunny. And I will typically not, I will ask you not to buy my guide if you like ask for a discount. If you were a student or something and then you ask for a discount, I will typically give you the discount. Mm -hmm. But if you're like a guy, you're like, I don't want to pay for this much for this. Can you give it to me for this? No, I cannot. Discounts are tough because if you give too many discounts, now it becomes one of those your business becomes too subjective where eventually you're going to have to be like, I gave that guy a discount. Does this guy deserve it too? Nah. Or does he? Nah. And it becomes too subjective. I'm like, bro, if you can't afford it, then look somewhere else. There's no shortage of content out there. It's actually really funny. So with the art of Twitter, I raise the price every time I do an update because the guide obviously becomes more valuable. Mm -hmm. And what happens is every time I raise the price, someone is going to reach out to me and be like, hey, can I get it at the old price? Like, no, the the old price had been live for like six, seven months. And if you wanted, wanted it at the old price, you could have gotten it at the old price. Now we have a new price. If you want it, you can get it at this price or don't get it. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, these guys don't value your work and they don't, they're not going to do anything with the guide. They're just morons because someone who wants to start a business are they going to be like, this guide costs 90 bucks and this is 200 bucks. And the 110 bucks are so important to me that I'm not going to start a business today. Of course not. If you want to start a business, you would buy a guide at 200, 300, 400, whatever. Assuming it works, you can see the reviews, whatever, and you would get it and you would earn your money back soon. It's only people who would like to waste their time, who ha haven't made the decision to actually start a business and they're just jacking off and doing nothing. Mental they're masturbation. the ones, yeah, the whole mental masturbation crowd. They're like waiting to see what will happen and checking the price every three days. And then suddenly it goes up and now they have the FOMO thing. Hey, I should have gotten at the old price. Let me message the guy. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are becoming aware of these types of customers where in 2019, if you were one of those exposed accounts, uh, you were blowing up. Nowadays, a lot of these exposed accounts aren't as hot in 2023 because a lot of the audience members are like, wait a minute, the people that you're exposing, are they really scams or did the people that buy from them didn't put in the work? Because nowadays, there's a lot of these archetypes of customers that we see that don't put in the work. They just whine and throw a hissy fit without putting in the hours. I've been noticing that. With I agree. Have you had that type of customer though? Someone who gets a product and complains to you. My social skills didn't improve by a book. <laughs> Luckily, not yet. I haven't had moments like that. The main problem I've had was with bootlegging, but I haven't had a point where someone 
vehemently hit me up and said, this didn't work for me. Um, thank God. I, I don't know why that's happened to me. I'm pretty sure it will happen in the future, but it hasn't happened to me yet. And I think also because I never try to do any pressure sales tactics. It's completely permission-based marketing where if you want it, you can use your own will to decide to get it. I'm not going to actively try to sell you or anything like that. So I think a lot of these guys, due to them selling themselves on the content, um, will put in the work. And I actually, I'm just thinking of a theory, but I haven't had a moment like that. I have had weird clients, though, uh, with consulting, where none of them were aggressive or anything. But uh, every now and then, like um, the broke guys, they'll say that they'll show up on Sunday, 3 p.m., and then they just don't show up. I'm like, bro, no update or anything like that. Once that happens two to four times, I'm like, all right, bro, I got to rethink my strategy. The best type of people to work with are people in 40s to 60s, uh, preferably introverted. And I'm talking about with my clientele, introverted and from overseas. For some reason, these folks resonate a lot with me because I look like one of them. Um, and they are beautiful to work with. They show up on time. They apply everything. I like that group. In case someone doesn't show up, do you still charge for the session? So, man, here's the thing. I'm giving you insights from 2019 where I didn't really ever have experience with consulting. So I was learning on the fly. Back then, if they didn't show up in 10 minutes, I should have charged, but I didn't. I just didn't want to build. I gave them the benefit of the doubt. I'm like, oh, maybe he got in a car accident or something like that. But in hindsight, I'm like, bro, if you don't show up, I'm still going to charge you. Yeah, of course you should charge them because, you know, yeah. your time got wasted. You could have scheduled another client or something else in that time. Yeah, yeah. Because with consulting, man, there's no book on this is exactly what you do. So a lot of it you're learning on the fly, especially when you're building your own practice in the beginning stages. So I learned, I have some battle scars. Tell me more things you've learned from consulting. Yeah. So to answer your question, I think one of the most important things to understand with consulting is to know if you're actually consulting or if you're coaching. Coaching is when your customer is looking for inspiration, while with consulting, your customer is looking for answers. So just to give you an example, let's say, Harsh, you live in the US, okay, and your wife lives in Canada, and you want to understand the process of how to bring your wife from Canada to US. In a situation like this, you don't need no damn inspiration. You just need the answers. So you hit up a consultant and you get the answers for what the whole visa process is like. That's the consultant path. Where with coaching, let's say you have a speech coming up and your coach just says, here's how you build a speech and you call it that. That's not enough for this guy who is hitting you up because he's terrified to give a speech in front of 500 people. Now you got to amp him up. You see? Do you see the difference, first of all? Yes. And now, so you really got to understand the business that you're in because coaching in itself it's not just something you could do as a side gig. It often consumes you because it becomes a career. While with consulting, it's something that you could easily do. And it helps if you have a pre-existing rapport with the person. So that's one of the things I learned. You got to really understand if you're a consultant or if you're a coach. Interesting. Yeah, I can see in your line of consulting how that can be confusing. For the consulting that I used to do, it was mostly legal tax consulting. So for me, it was always pure consulting. It was no coaching. Right. Where it got to a point where at so sometimes I was coaching and that wasn't really something that I liked to do. Where with consulting, I liked it. Where let's say there's a guy in Tampa. He's a realtor and he wants to understand how to write a book, how to take it from manuscript to market. He'll book a consulting with me and I'll literally outline the entire process for him. That is where he's just looking for answers. He's not like, come on, man, you could do it. You could write this book. He's just like, I just want the answers, bro. So you could do a little bit of both for the type of business that you're in as well. I agree. I do think that coaching is a longer term process than consulting. Consulting mm -hmm. is, you know, you need the information for some time and, you know, the guy is going to leave after that. Coaching is more longer term. I know some people on Twitter who do nutrition coaching where they teach people how to eat correctly. And that pays really well and has a lot of 
good results for the customer where a guy might actually be obese and have metabolic disorder diabetes etc mm-hmm. and you can show him how to eat such that all of that can be fixed right one good thing well the pro and cons of the whole coaching slash consulting the con is that it takes your time up right you're t- trading in time for money but the pro is that you're always being introduced to new problems that your market is facing so if you're some sort of content creator you never run out of ideas because you just keep consistently getting new problems to solve and it serves as this little flywheel for you in the long term i agree actually this is something that a lot of people don't realize but a very easy way of getting content ideas is to either coach people or to ask amas you know ask me anything or and to leave your dms open so people can ask you questions what's bothering them what they would like answered and that gives you ideas on what to produce right in fact that's kind of where live intentionally was born people were people kept asking me you know i have this bad habit i can't seem to drop it what do i do what do i do mm-hmm. and i was so tired of answering them that i'm like wait a minute let me just make an ebook and you guys can pay for the ebook download it and that will be your solution right the answer was just presented to you the answer was presented to you and now whenever asks me something about you know i can't fix this habit i just send them to the ebook man that's smart do you still have any form of coaching consulting for life math money brand i have never done any form of coaching or consulting for the life math money brand ever not even once never except a single penny in consulting would you if someone said i'll give you $10,000 for an hour of your time probably not <laughs> probably as a not. matter of principle i do not accept money for my time i don't want to sell my time gotcha so it's a ma- matter of principle i might just consult you for free you know if you offer like a huge sum i'm like wait a minute you need it a lot i'll just like fine get on a call but i doubt i would sell my time i i might you know who knows if the offer is presented that's when you find out right. and personally if i'm like actually giving you the call i might as well take the money so i'm not against it i'm not against taking money mm-hmm. but it could probably be a one time thing or something I, it would not be something like hey i'm a consultant you can reach out to me and you know get coaching or whatever right you might do it in the future but i i would be surprised personally i think it's like a sin to sell your time so so i used to think that, i used to think that too but nowadays my viewpoint on that has evolved just a little bit towards a different direction i think it's a sin to sell your time if you hate it but i think if there's some sort of joy that it's attracting you to that then i think that's fine so with one of the guys that i'm consulting he routinely uh, wants to you know re up the packages and me and him have this chemistry it's very fun talking to him he's let's say 48 years old he's a ceo of his own company so i'm learning a lot he's learning from me and it's a synergistic relationship so this is one of those things where there's a pull for me to do it even these episodes we're not getting paid or anything but this is um a fun thing to do but if i'm even saying let's say i have a modicum of disgust towards the other person and i'm like man this guy is just a hassle he whines a lot i don't give a damn if he's paying me $50,000 for 1 hour i still don't want to work with him so for me the emotional aspect is very big when determining do i sell my time or not I agree with you there. See, if you're learning something then and you can get paid for it, then you should take it. Yeah. For example, if I'm hired as like Amazon wants to hire me to for whatever reason and I think oh hey, I might learn something about logistics here and I have to sell some of my time, I would be happy to do that if I think the ROI is worth it. What I mean is what I'm against is you know like a pure time for money transactional type of business where you're like anybody can hire me it costs this much for this much time. I see exactly what you're saying. I mean for some businesses like a doctor which quite frankly I do not consider to be a real business it's more like a job in other way. Mhm. It's unavoidable. You, you just made a lot of enemies with Bengali and Indian parents. No, it's see, a doctor. <laughs> no, no, you're right, you're 1000% right though. Yeah. But it's not a it's not a business, right? At the end of the day you have to be there to provide the service and if you're not then the business doesn't exist. Absolutely. 
think of it like this if the entrepreneur does not show up for a week would things still work as long as you have the right systems yep or does can it can it work with a doctor no nope. the surgeon doesn't show up for a week so it's not a business same with lawyers and contractors and stuff robert kiyosaki had that quadrant e s b i employee self employed business and investor doctors and stuff are self employed but they're not business exactly but i think that lawyers and some of these professions it can eventually become a business let's say you have more partners or whatever keep lawyers as employees just use your brand name and you know try to get your firm's brand to develop so people hire your firm mm-hmm. it can become a business but a guy who is practicing law it's not a business right you know i actually know some doctors who have really good and very profitable businesses the business is diagnostics so you could go and get a mri scan done etc there's a lot of ways to if you're a hustler there's a lot of ways to make money as a doctor exactly if you're a doctor it's very easy to start some kind of medical business in fact i can give you guys an idea you can start a business that's essentially based on measuring body fat accurately no one's doing that for some stupid reason no in india no one is and it's so difficult to find out what your body fat is it's an so accurate difficult. one so you could get a dexa machine and you know a proper electrostatus machine and you know the whole water estimation thing i forget what it's called where they dip you in water mhm and estimate people's body fat nowadays there are so many people going to the gym that it's a going to be a high demand service or if they could even build some sort of tool that they could sell forever something because that is a pain point for sure because sometimes you'll hold one of these these tools have you seen it in the gym or apparently yeah. they're measuring your body fat sometimes it'll show as 20% other times it's 14% only one day has passed you're like wait a minute man this shit's not accurate and then they also have the pinching thing have you seen the, the pinching thing the calipers yes i have both of them yeah but is it easy to set up the calipers are not accurate in any way simply because they can only measure your skin folds right so mm-hmm. at best they can calculate your you know your subcutaneous fat accurately the fat under your skin but a lot of people have fat around their organs the visceral fat and that can't be calculated by calipers so all of these systems are just approximations if you take dexa it's mm-hmm. also an appro- approximation what it's doing is it's shooting x rays at you not exactly x rays but you know it's shooting some radiation down at you and creating like a two dimensional map a picture of your body but it's two dimensional and because it's two dimensional it has to make certain assumptions about okay this part is supposed to be this dense this part is supposed to be this dense etc and based on that it's coming up with a body fat percentage so there is no highly accurate way of determining body fat percentage but i hope they come up with better ways in the future right 